Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Thanks very much for being here for today's update. We saw parts of Vermont with significant rain and winds yesterday, but overall, we made it out better than expected. Although, it appears Rutland and Addison counties were affected the most with high winds, which led to more power outages compared to earlier this week. The utility crews are working hard and have made a lot of progress since last night. Yesterday, the state unfortunately confirmed its first fatality related to flooding. I want to express my sincere condolences to the Duval family, Stephen's friends, and my hometown of Barrie for this heartbreaking loss. While we continue to have an eye on the immediate response, we know communities and families are reeling and need our help. So we'll be actively moving on our recovery work as a result. On an individual level, over the next 48 hours, it's incredibly important to get flooded homes, businesses, and public buildings as dry as possible to prevent other outcomes like mold. And we're working on resources to help with that. Dr. Levine is here with us today to talk about health and safety when dealing with floodwaters and responding to the damage it causes. And when it comes to recovery, the federal government continues to be incredibly helpful. On Monday, um, I'll, be, uh, I'll be welcoming the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, to Vermont and will survey impacted infrastructure and talk about how we rebuild and recover. And as you know, last night I submitted to President Biden a request for a federal uh, major disaster declaration. And I'm happy to say about 20 minutes ago, the President approved that request. So I'm very grateful for the speed of FEMA and the White House. It will open up significant federal resources for communities, individuals, businesses, and the state. We'll have more uh, detailed information on that with a press release on the approval right after the press conference. In anticipation of these funds, we're working to develop a concrete list of resources to help impacted Vermonters and making sure it's as easy as possible for Vermonters to access those. In a few minutes, Secretary Tebbets will also discuss damage sustained to our farms and resources available to them. Lastly, I've been inspired by the thousands of Vermonters, businesses, and organizations who have reached out wanting to help. As we transition to recovery, we know we'll need all the help we can get. You can sign up to volunteer at vermont.gov volunteer or with local community organizations. There's a ton of work to do. An impact of Vermonters will need all the help we can provide. I know Vermonters will continue to step up and meet the moment. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison to give a situational update and report on the recovery work that will soon begin. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Good morning, my fellow Vermonters. We are relieved that last night's storms did not bring the full fury that we anticipated. There are areas that were hit quite hard, but we did not receive any calls for evacuation or rescue. Today, we will keep teams staged throughout the state ready to respond to emergencies. You will also see air assets out today looking for vehicles in waterways or other places that they don't belong. To date, we have performed 202 rescue missions. We've assisted with approximately 100 evacuations and have conducted dozens of vehicle checks to ensure that no one is trapped inside. As of this morning, as the governor mentioned, there is just the one known fatality associated with this event. Last night, our power outages spiked to around 14,000, but are down to approximately 3,500 and the, currently the highest number of those outages is in Rutland County. It looks like we will have a day or two of decent weather in most parts of the state. It's gonna be easy to think that we're out of the woods, yet several of our communities are still reeling from last night's events. And, and candidly, the, the high winds, the rainfall, um, thunderstorms complicated an already devastating situation locally. 
in, in many communities. So please remember our neighbors right now, particularly along the 22A corridor, towns like Bridport, Shoreham, Cornwall, and Middlebury were hit hard last night. And let's remember that we're all in this together. We're beginning the work of understanding the federal disaster declaration just signed by President Biden this morning. As the governor mentioned, this will open up a variety of streams of funding to assist Vermont individuals, businesses, and municipalities, as well as the state. And we're gonna have more details on that very soon. It is important to note that we did not wait for this declaration to summon federal disaster assistance. There have been numerous FEMA resources on the ground here in Vermont since very early this week. Specifically, there are two incident management assistance teams, one here in Berlin and one temporarily staged in South Burlington. There are two disaster survivor assistance teams, each with 35 people at a staging area awaiting deployment. One urban search and rescue incident support team at the Vermont National Guard Armory in White River Junction, uh, plus two USAR type three task forces that have been hard at work with our state and local teams for days. There are also two disaster emergency communication teams deployed to the EOC in Berlin and one in White River Junction. As of eight o'clock this morning, there are 198 FEMA personnel deployed to Vermont. 132 personnel are already on the ground and 66 more are en route. Now more than ever, it is important that municipalities clearly communicate with state officials. We cannot assist you at the local level if you do not communicate your needs to the emergency operations center. Whatever it is, food, water, transportation, infrastructure or supplies, please make your needs known so we can start problem solving with you. Because there are two to three dozen communities that we have not heard from despite our outreach, today we are sending National Guard troops to th those communities to establish contact and ensure that every town and city in Vermont knows how to reach the State Emergency Operations Center. And I'd also like to remind homeowners and business owners to report your damages to not to 211. 211 is the place to call so we can accurately track the magnitude of damages both to, to individual homes and property and businesses. I'll finish up with just a quick word about the status of state-run shelters. Uh, as of 8 o'clock this morning, there were 35 people seeking shelter in Barrie, 4 in Rutland, 23 in Johnson, 6 in Ludlow, and 0 in Hartford. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Levine. Thanks, Commissioner Morrison. Good morning. I'd like to start today by thanking everyone in this response for working so quickly and so hard to keep Vermonters safe. And to all Vermonters, your willingness to help and take care of one another continues to inspire me and never ceases to inspire me during difficult times. We've had our share of consecutive once in a century events and you give new meaning to the word resilience. As the governor noted, the Department of Health did report our first and only to date death as sure tragedy and we join the governor in extending our condolences to family and community. Now I know that experiencing property loss of your own of your, or of your neighbor or your community or just the stress and uncertainty surrounding crises like these can take a toll on our mental health. Please recognize that's completely okay and reach out for help if you or someone you know is struggling. In addition to all of our local resources, there is now a national disaster stress hotline that you can call or text for support, 1-800-985-5990. Now, unfortunately, we know that climate change will continue to make severe weather a threat to our world. So it's important to understand how it impacts our health and what we can do in the short and long term to mitigate these impacts. As we all work toward recovering from this disaster, returning to homes and reopening businesses, 
It's my task today to share some guidance for staying as safe and healthy as possible. Let's start with drinking water. If you're, not, if you're on a municipal water system, follow their guidance on boil water or do not drink orders. But if you have a private well or spring and are in a flooded area, you should assume your water is contaminated. Don't drink or use your water for cooking, baby formula, washing food, or brushing teeth until you can have it tested. The health department is offering free test kits for anyone impacted by the flooding. These kits check for bacteria, nitrates, other chemicals or contaminants. Please call our public health laboratory at 802-338-4724 or check our website, which also has this number, for more information that can be tailored to your particular situation. Boiling your water for one minute kills bacteria and other organisms. But don't use or boil water that's untested if it's cloudy, full of sediments, or smells like fuel or chemicals. Next talk about water in the swimming and water safety capacity. Even once the skies have cleared, people and pets should stay out of any body of water after a heavy rain or flooding event. This has always been true, even in non-disaster circumstances. High water and strong undercurrents can linger and carry debris several days after a storm, making swimming or boating in these areas dangerous for anyone. Bodies of water may also be contaminated by microorganisms, fuel, and wastewater runoff. Swimming in contaminated areas can result in rashes, sore throats, diarrhea, or more serious problems from bacterial infection. So it's best to find another summer activity or place to cool off until waters are calm and cool again, especially in light of the fact that we have repeated rain events uh, throughout this time period. Next, returning to your home. Wait until local officials say it's safe and standing water has gone down. Watch for any downed power lines, gas leaks, or damaged fuel tanks. If you smell natural gas, which smells like rotten eggs, or hear hissing, leave immediately and call your local utility. If electrical circuits and electrical equipment have gotten wet or are, or are in or near water, turn off the power. If accessing the main power switch requires entering standing water, you should consult with an electrician and never use a generator inside your home, basement, or garage, or less than 20 feet from any window, door, or vent. And if you're entering in such an area and you have cuts or sustain any injuries with nails or the like, please remember to check your tetanus status and obtain a tetanus shot if that is due. Finally, cleaning your home, which I've seen a lot of efforts uh, being conducted as we speak. First of all, we're not recommending anybody test for mold. If your home has been flooded and closed up for several days, you should assume your home has mold. So obviously you'll need to dry it out, opening doors and windows. You can use fans and dehumidifiers when electricity is safe. Children with breathing problems and people with weakened immune systems should not help clean up after a flood. Those who are helping should wear protective clothing. Time to get out again the N95 masks and gloves. You can clean moldy items and surfaces that do not absorb water using soap and water. But other materials like fabrics and cushions will probably need to be thrown away. You can find more information by visiting our website at healthvermont.gov slash flood. Now knowing that Secretary Tebbets is up next, I'll leave the brunt of food safety for him, but I will leave you with this strong recommendation. Don't eat or drink anything that has touched flood water. 
throw away contaminated food along with any foods that have not been refrigerated properly. When in doubt, throw it out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. De Levine, and good morning, uh, Vermonters. Um, so here we are. We, we know the story. Uh, we've seen the images. Uh, we've witnessed the heartbreaking pictures of water tearing through our, our cities and our towns and villages, uh, uprooting our roads and our bridges, uh, flooding our farms, and destroying our crops. Uh, this tragic event follows closely on the heels of a hard freeze uh, many of our farmers experienced in May. It's too early to uh, uh, fully describe or even estimate the damages, but it's clear the losses will be catastrophic and our farmers, small businesses, and agriculture producers will need help. We expect the excessive flooding and silt will destroy a large share of our produce and livestock feed. In our hilly state, some of our most fertile uh, farmland lies in the river valleys, in countless fields of corn, hay, vegetables, fruit, and pasture were swamped and buried. Vermont's growing season is short, and a historic flood in the heart of our limited window to grow food and crops is particularly devastating. Many crops cannot be replanted, and losses will not be effectively recovered or mitigated prior to our early fall harvest. Farming is challenging and rewarding, but heavy losses of agriculture products or feed will put many at risk. There is a ripple effect. The disruption to our farms may disrupt our regional food system and our food security. The widespread flooding we suffered throughout Vermont this week is among the worst of the last century, and it arrived in the heart of our growing season. So what's next? Farmers are already cleaning up, They're calculating their losses, and preparing for the fall and the winter. The work will not stop. We want our farmers, producers, and nurseries to document their losses. There will be a time we will need that information to present to our federal partners, including FEMA and the United States Department of Agriculture. Farmers should contact their insurance agent. We encourage our farmers to visit our webpage for any of our, or any of our social media channels we have put together a packet of resources that may help farmers navigate the many issues that they're facing. Again, that information can be found on the Agency of Agriculture's homepage. What can the public do? This is the time to support farmers. Maybe it's checking on your neighbors to see if they need a hand with a chore or an errand. Maybe it's attending a farmer's market or buying meat, cheese, or produce from a farm stand. Maybe it's hopping on the computer and buying a product so it's delivered in the mail. Or maybe you can donate to a fund that's focused on farmers. There are many. Farmers are rugged, hardworking, creative, darn tough governor, curious, and kind. They love their land, but they are hurting like the thousands of Vermonters who have lost their homes or businesses. Farmers feed us and they will continue to feed us. Let's do our part to support them as we navigate this historic event with them. One of our strong partners has been the Agency of Transportation, who's helped restore many of our routes to support our farmers. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Secretary Flynn for an update. Thank you, Secretary Tebbets. AOT has had its first response-related injury while driving a 10-wheel dump truck. Yesterday, a sinkhole opened up and the truck stopped dead in its tracks. I'm pleased to report that after the driver was evaluated at a local hospital, uh, they returned to work, anxious to get back to the job at hand. More updates. As a result of the damage on Interstate 89 that occurred Monday, requiring us to close the uh, interstate northbound. There, you will see some paving out there today, and there will be a temporary restriction to one lane northbound while the damaged pavement is repaired. The VTR, which is the Western Rail Corridor, should open later today, allowing the Amtrak Ethan Allen into Burlington tonight, 
with southbound passenger service restoring tomorrow morning. Currently across the state, AOT is working with 47 private contractors on our state road projects. That's an increase of 15 private contractors since we spoke yesterday. There remain 19 state roads fully closed. Nine roads are partially closed. And I would like to take a moment to share with you an enormous amount of effort over the last 48 hours of the following list of roads that have been reopened across the state of Vermont. Route 2 in Marshfield between Plainfield Village and Nazmith Brook Road. It is a gravel surface, so motorists must be prudent with their speed. Route 2 in Marshfield just east of the village center. It too is gravel but passable. Route 2 in Duxbury between Vermont 100 and Vermont 100B. Route 2 in Waterbury near Fars Field. Route 2 in Middlesex near Lower Barnet Hill Road. Vermont 14 in Callis at Perkin Brook Road is open but gravel. US 302 in Berry Town from Old Route 302 to the roundabout. US 302 in East Berry Road between Waterman Street and Messier Drive in the vicinity of the VFW. The Waterbury Park and Ride off Lincoln Street has reopened. Vermont 64 in Williamstown between Vermont 14 and I-89 has reopened. Vermont 12 in Brookfield near Baker's Pond no longer is being monitored and is open. Vermont 12 in Berlin near Rowell Hill Road also is no longer being monitored and is reopened. Vermont 12 in Hardwick at Bridge 66 is open to one lane. Vermont 12 in Roxbury, Warren Mountain Road to Granville Town Line has been reopened. And then Vermont 103 in Chester, Vermont 100 in Wardsboro to Jamaica, Vermont 107, Stockbridge to Bethel, Vermont 100 in Londonderry, Vermont 100 in Weston, Vermont 10 in Chester, Vermont 5 in Westminster, Vermont 66, Route 66 in Randolph, Vermont 4 in Woodstock, Vermont 110 in Tunbridge, Vermont 106 in Reading, Vermont 14 in Randolph, Gas, uh, excuse me, Vermont 14 in Randolph, Vermont 103, Gassets to Proctorville. There is alternating one way traffic, but it is open. Ludlow South to Weston on Vermont 100 is open to emergency vehicles and limited local traffic. Plymouth, Vermont 100A has multiple slow zones but open. Vermont 15 in Cambridge at the Wrong Way Bridge is now reopened. The intersection of Vermont 108 at Vermont 15, Jeff reopened. Intersection of Vermont 108 and 109 has reopened. Vermont 2 at the Richmond Exit 11 is reopened. Vermont 5 Coventry to North Newport. Vermont 5 Barton to Orleans. Vermont 5 Depot Street in St. Johnsbury. Vermont 105 near Hilliker Store. Vermont 58 Orleans to Brownington. Vermont 16 Barton to Hardwick. Vermont 122 in Lindenville. Vermont 15 in Hardwick is open with traffic light control. And Vermont 232 is open to traffic and emergency one lane. Now I remind you this has all occurred in the last 48 hours. Much of it has been because Mother Nature has cooperated with receding water. But each and every one of these sites that I've just read have required that we visit them to assure that they're safe to open to the public. Our crews have been extremely busy, as has everybody. I would like to say also, reinforcing what Commissioner Morrison mentioned about communities contacting the SEOC, um, we, working with the SEOC in emergency management, AOT has been able to contact 228 towns. There are still 24 we have not been able to contact. Currently, AOT is assisting 15 towns. 
There was one new closure last night as a result of the rain. Vermont 346 and Pownell. Actually, that's a result of trees and utilities across the road. Vermont 155 and Mount Holly is a result of the rainstorm last night. A deep culvert washout has failed. There has also been a large bank slide and erosion on Vermont 100 in Washington. Currently, our geotech team is out there today planning on what the fix for that will be. 40 bridges were inspected yesterday across the state, local and state-owned bridges. To date, 121 bridges have been inspected. Six rail bridges were inspected yesterday. Four of them were on the line through Barry and Montpelier, referred to as the Little Whacker. There still are some rail bridges that are difficult to get to and inspections still need to be conducted. Some updates on some roads. Bridge 116 in Bridgewater on Vermont 100 in the area the governor and I visited on Saturday, which was a result of the Friday storm, will have a temporary bridge installed tonight, but it will not be open to the public until we finish the work of the approaches to the bridge. But the big effort was to get the bridge brought in from Brattleboro and get it put in place. One town highway bridge structure in Jamaica on Route 30 has been closed due to being compromised. We are currently in conversations with the town of Jamaica on plans for the way forward regarding that structure. Rail. 306 miles of rail remain closed. 103 miles of rail have reopened in the last 24 hours. I would like to just say too, most Vermonters don't see the work that's going on on railroads because they're often off in the middle of nowhere. But the effort that's been put into reestablishing the rail lines amongst our, part our partners with Vermont Rail Systems and contractors working on those lines, among other things, are enabling Amtrak to get back into Burlington tonight. The Green Mountain Railroad in East Wallingford does have a large slope failure, and frankly, it's getting worse. There's a lot of work left to do on that line between Rutland and Bellis Falls. The Connecticut River Line, which runs the eastern side of the state up to Newport, is now fully open. And as I mentioned, the Little Whacker between Water, I'm excuse me, uh, Barry and Montpelier a moment ago, there is some very severe damage on that line and planning continues for the way forward there. The 10 state-owned airports are operational. There are no impacts. And the two AOT-owned dams have no issues at this time. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we'll turn, open it up to questions. Well, we'll be working on that. Uh, I think that was for their maybe their quarterly filings, yeah. but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, the quarterlies were in June, I believe. So this is probably in September. So we have a little bit of time okay. uh, to figure that out, but we'll we'll obviously uh, react accordingly and do everything we can to um, reduce the burden on impacted Vermonters. You know, along those lines, I had some store owners in Montpelier ask me yesterday if the state was considering delaying their collection of sales tax by the end of the month so that was money they could use to help uh, with their recovery. Is that something that's Yeah, it's all in the mix. I mean, we, we don't know what we're going to do, but, uh, but we uh, are certainly aware of the impacts on um, businesses and uh, we want to do anything we can to alleviate that. So that's, that's part of one of our discussions. Unemployment filings. Number one, I mean, at what point do people qualify for unemployment? Like if they can't get to work, if their car is, you know, unusable? And have you seen any uptick in filings? I, I'm not aware of the uptick at this point in time, but it's anticipated. Um, there are a number of people who can't get to work who, where their businesses are closed. So we fully anticipate uh, and we're preparing uh, for that. Uh, the arrival of uh, many uh, who uh, who will be filing for claims. So um, we're uh, we'll 
we're working on that as we speak. Is there anything the state can do to prevent um, employers from firing people if they can't get to work? Um, I, I believe there is. I, I, I would have a hard time believing that anyone would do that, uh, especially with you know the workforce challenges we face. Uh, we uh, we need every single employee we have. Uh, I, I can't I can't imagine any employer uh, doing that. But but obviously we will react accordingly. For those employees who are working. With I've been working with downtown businesses across the state, and now there's just a huge recovery cleanup effort. Is their main recourse for the next few weeks unemployment, or is it FEMA money that covers salaries? How does that work? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. Uh, thankfully, we have a couple of FEMA representatives here. I don't know if you are prepared to answer anything like that, but sure. please come up and identify yourself. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm Sam Harvey. I work with FEMA on the individual assistance side. Uh, yes, there is the approval for disaster unemployment assistance, uh, which is a grant from FEMA to the state to help with anybody who, because of the disaster, lost wages or lost employment. Um, they would apply through the uh, Vermont Department of Labor uh, and go through that process. So that's a separate fund that's set up for them? Correct. So when will individuals be able to apply for individual assistance? What will that look like, and, and how much can people uh, see potentially? Sure. So for those that were impacted, uh, that had uninsured disaster losses, they can apply for FEMA assistance uh, as early as today, now that the declaration has been approved. Uh, we'll continue to roll out those programs, um, but they can call 1-800-621-FEMA, 1-800-621-3362 go to disasterassistance.gov um, or interact with one of our disaster survivor assistance um, operators in the field to apply. Uh, that will start the process going. Each individual will have a, a different time frame and path forward based on their, um, their situation and, and what they're able to provide. Uh, and each individual based again on their scenario will have uh, availability to, to different funds for home repair, for temporary housing, and for a loss to personal property. Is there a deadline to apply? Is there a certain window you have to apply on? Yes, right now there's going to be a 30 day uh, deadline. Um, that clock will start ticking uh, today since the uh, declaration just came down. The administrator, Chris Well, was here earlier in the week. She said uh, to the miners, don't wait to fix things. Get them down now, take pictures, worry about female reimbursement later. Is that still the operating message? Yes, that is still accurate. I would not encourage anybody to delay any repairs, necessary repairs. Uh, when our FEMA inspectors go out to look at the property, they are trained to identify um, what has been repaired, uh, anything that may have been impacted by the storm. I know that FEMA is able to provide, I think it's a $700 emergency check. So can you explain to us a little bit more about how you get that, how quickly it can Sure. Uh, I believe what you're referring to is critical needs assistance. Mm -hmm. That's part of the assistance that would uh, potentially be available as a survivor applies. So the same process applies, and then based on the information that they provide, their unique situation, uh, they could potentially be eligible for that assistance. Okay. And what can that be used for? It's intended to be used for any critical needs. So that could be for, um, for uh, loss to um, to, to food, lost to, uh, they had to pay for a hotel room out of pocket, you know, any of those things that uh, are required in the interim just to, to get them through. Will any uh, the people need to provide their receipts to prove what they use it for? Is there any kind of check on that? It's always advisable to save receipts uh, and to have those available. Depending on uh, exactly what they're reported as losses, there may be requests for, uh, for verification of it. Um, but it'll depend on each survivor's situation. And for the $700 check and then the other assistance that people may qualify for, is that taxable? It is not. It is a, a grant. Okay. Calvin asked about the, the dollar amounts that people can get. My understanding is about 41000 for damage to a home and then 41000 other needs that they might have. Am I correct? 
That's correct. There are three distinct categories. Housing repair for homeowners that have to make repair to, to drywall, to carpet and such. Um, rental assistance for those that have to be displaced from their home and personal property for their, their clothing and home furnishings. Each one of those has a, a cap of $41,000, um, although I, I would encourage that it's, it's dependent upon unique situations, so I would not look at that as a target for what uh, any individual could uh, necessarily expect. We've got some folks on the phone, so I'm going to go there and then we come back to the room. We'll start with Bob Audette, Crowd Borough Reformer. Thank you. I don't have any questions right now. Thank you, Bob. Let's try Keith from Harold. Hi. Um, has anyone checked on or is monitoring the, uh, the health and welfare of our unhoused population? They are being treated just like everyone else at this point, Keith. Uh, if they are unhoused and need assistance, uh, they should also uh, call uh, 211, and uh, we are there for them as well. Thank you. Derek, seven days. Yes, thank you. Uh, has the state been able to assess the uh, scope of damage to uh, mobile home parts around the state? Do you know how many have been damaged? Or has there been state or federal level outreach to parks that are affected? Yeah, we are aware of um, some mobile home parks, and we are uh, looking into those at this point in time. And um, in fact, there was one in uh, we visited uh, two days ago in in Barry uh, that was heavily impacted again uh, from the storm. Um, is there anybody here who might be able to speak to that? Yeah, um, Commissioner Morrison uh, had to leave. We'll. Um, We'll get back to you on that and give you a report on that tomorrow. But, um, but I, I have uh, been concerned about our mobile home parks because I was um, very, uh, um, I was involved, I guess, during Irene uh, with uh, many of the mobile home parks throughout the state. In fact, a lot of the deconstruction, recycling, and so forth was uh, done by a, a team I put together. So we are, we are very uh, aware of that situation. Thanks. And I had one other question. I was hoping to get a little bit more uh, clarity on those uh, two dozen or so towns that, that were mentioned as not uh, not having had contact with state officials um, yet. Are those towns or any of those towns in areas of the state that were known to be affected by the floods? And um, when when you say the National Guard will be deployed to those places, what what will that look like? Yeah, we'll have a liaison uh, from the National Guard go into the communities uh, just to make sure that we're. We're talking to them face to face without an email, without a phone call, and so forth. We don't we don't want to wait for that. Uh, obviously, something's being missed, so we want to be sure that uh, we have this contact, so we know what the needs are of the communities. Because uh, if we if they don't contact us, we don't always know, uh, and so uh, that's what we're trying to to alleviate. Uh, you know the sure. okay, Secretary Flynn. From the uh, AOT perspective, the majority of those towns that I mentioned were, are in northwestern Vermont, where there was much less impact from this event than the rest of the state. So we would call that our District 5 and our District 8 garages in the towns in that area, probably just because they don't have a lot to tell us. But we're not relying on that. We're going to continue to try to assure we have contact. Thank you. Joseph Gresser, Brattleboro uh, Chronicle. Hi, uh, Mark Chronicle, that's okay. Um, up here in Orleans County, there are many people who are concerned about the safety of the Casella landfill all the time. Um, was there any special attention given to um, things like potential runoff or other problems that might have resulted strictly from the uh, heavy rainfall. Well, first of all, Joe, I know you're from Barton, so, uh, you know, there's an inspection process at the landfills on a daily basis. So anything, any slides, any, any deviation from normal operating procedures are identified and, uh, and repaired uh, every single day. 
So I would imagine that's still the case. Okay. Uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Gendron just uh, said that uh, that is the case. So we are not aware of anything, but uh, but they are they are inspected every single day. Thank you. I have one other question. Uh, I was visiting uh, an organization that had um, a uh, lithium battery powered snowblower. Um, which they took out of a flooded basement and came back the next day to find um, in ashes. Is this something that people should be aware of? Um, at this point in time, I don't know if we can answer that. And uh, we'll certainly look into it and get back to you and maybe identify that as, a, as an issue. Uh, but, um, but I'm not prepared to answer it right here from the podium. To give us an opportunity to look into it, and then we'll we'll assess that. Fair enough. Thank you, Chad. News ten. If you could just speak up on the phone. Chad. Uh, winds coming today. All right. We'll back to the Are there any particular uh, areas? Question about that. Do you know how much milk has been dumped? Uh, I gather from the, the website that, that that is concerned. Any sense of how much and what's been done about it? Just a little uh, background. As uh, many of you know, you know, cows have to be milked twice a day, uh, and then it's gone into a, a holding tank for storage. And pickup, it could be, depending on the size of the farm, could be every day or could be every other day. Uh, so. Um, there's not a lot of capacity to keep the milk cool on the farm. It has to be transported to the creamery uh, to be processed into, you know, cheese or butter, yogurt, et cetera. So when we had a number of roads that washed out and uh, collapsed, um, that put a real strain on our transportation system and picking up the milk. So um, it's not as bad as we thought it was going to be. Uh, there's still pockets of it. Um, of course, um, a gallon of milk that you have to throw away is a, is a, a sad day for a farmer. That's the, that's the revenue stream for a farm. Um, and it's also a loss because that's turned into valuable uh, product for, uh, to feed us. So um, there has been some great work done by transportation in identifying some areas that uh, priority, particularly Route 2. Uh, there was a lot of you know, the, the creamery in Cabot uh, getting that milk there was very, very important. Route 2 is open again, uh, so that milk is making its way to the creamery there. We still have some pockets uh, in the hills, uh, some of these back roads. We have some incredible uh, stories from farmers themselves uh, fixing roads. Uh, town of Cabot, a uh, farmer up there uh, yes, there got his um, tractor together, and these are the stories you're going to see all across the state of Vermont, people just doing the work that needs to be done. Uh, he got his track together. He's been repairing roads along with the town crew in Cabot, and that meant that his milk could be picked up and taken to the creamery. But uh, still some pockets out there, but it's better than we thought it was going to be. Um, you mentioned the frost. Uh, what are you looking at? To, I know it's early, but for the long-term impact on farm viability and the loss of these, these two major events, well, it's, uh, it's too early to tell, but I know there's a lot of discussions going on. You know, some of these farmers went through this uh, during Irene, um, like a lot of Vermonters went through this. Um, now they've gone through it again, uh, 12 years, is it, I think. Um, you know, so there's a lot, there's going to be a lot of discussions of what to do. Uh, we're prepared at the agency to work with, particularly, I think one area that we got to work on is the produce section. I think the produce uh, farmers, this came at the worst time for them. Much of their crop was coming in at this time. Um, that, um, you know, they, they, we have a very short growing season. There may be not enough time to replant. Maybe in some cases it can, they can replant and get another crop. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of discussions going on and a lot of uh, um, farmers probably pretty discouraged right now. Uh, but now we've got to evaluate the losses, uh, try to get them as much support as we can and have discussions with them uh, to prepare for the, uh, for the late summer and fall and into winter. 
I have not received any. That does not mean there have not been some. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, farmers are uh, pretty careful about taking care of their animals and getting them to where they need to go. Uh, now, there may have been, uh, but I have not received any, uh, you, know, uh, you know, big reports of losses for livestock. If, um, uh, let's say a, a dairy farmer, for instance, if their fields are flooded and their cows can't graze or they can't make hay, I mean, what are they doing? A couple of things we're encouraging farmers to do. There's going to be some testing done on the soil. So um, we're working closely with UVM Extension. Um, and uh, Dr. Heather Darby is an expert, uh, and she's been visiting farmers, looking at you know, the, what to do with the corn crop. Uh, there's a little debate whether the corn can be saved or not. Unlike Irene, it was too late in the season and may have lost. There may be a chance that some corn can be salvaged. I'm sorry, I'm not um, And on the hay side, I think we're going to have a hay issue. I think we're going to have a, an issue with a lot of uh, hay that's been destroyed that maybe cannot be uh, salvaged. So we're going to be testing both, um, you know, the uh, the crops to see if they're okay, and we're also going to be testing the soil uh, between our lab and UVM Extension. That's that's the plan. You brought up the May freeze. Have you heard an update from the feds about um, the yeah, disaster? Yeah, there were a number of DFVs. Uh, we reports. have not. Um, we have I heard from see, USDA uh, that um, from if we're going to get direct payments those the to those that were that impacted by the freeze, uh, and Congress is going to have to allocate some money for that. We believe the loss for our growers was about uh, $10 million during the May freeze. So we have heard from uh, USDA. They do have existing programs, that, but most of those are, are loans and not direct payments. But if we're going to get any direct payments uh, to those that suffered loss during the May freeze, uh, Congress is going to have to appropriate uh, a special money for them. Would that be in the farm bill or the budget negotiations? It could, uh, there's a number of vehicles. Um, there's some discussion in Washington. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of disasters that have happened over the uh, United States over the last year, and sometimes they put together a special appropriation just for natural disasters related to agriculture. We think that may be a vehicle, but we're in close contact with our, our delegation. Um, the other thing is uh, the region has been impacted, so we've had, um, you know, Connecticut was reaching out last night, Massachusetts was involved in this flood as well, so it's just not a Vermont issue. New York was impacted. Uh, so that as a region, we've had some serious uh, farm issues, both on the frost and on the flood, which may benefit us as we seek federal aid. Will you seek another uh, USDA disaster declaration? We're, we're looking into that. We're, we're under discussion. Maybe the overall FEMA one that the president has, has given us this may be enough, but we're prepared to well, file one in case we need an additional scouting. one. Uh, and get that to the governor for his signature to present it to the United States Department of Agriculture. This is a super brief question, but you mentioned that this was a, a regional event and a lot of crops have been damaged. And as the climate warms and severe weather events continue to happen, are you concerned about long-term food security? Uh, I think we're always concerned about that. You know, um, that's sometimes we, we forget about um, when farmers sometimes are criticized for whatever they, some practice or what they do, but in the end they're, they're feeding us. Um, and um, you know, I think Vermont is in a, in a good spot without these natural disasters. Uh, we can produce a lot of great food for the region. Um, we can produce more, uh, but it's challenging. Uh, the, you know, the price point to the farmer is always a challenge. Uh, we've got a national system. We probably should have a regional system. But a lot of people are working on that. Uh, you know, Vermont can produce a lot of great food for Boston and New York and the Northeast. Uh, they just need to have that, sy that system supported. But it's very complicated, everything from transportation to getting it to market and getting a, a return to the farmer that's, uh, that's fair. Yep. Sorry, go ahead. If the feds are able to provide relief, I'm wondering, is there a difference in how um, non-food producers can receive relief? I'm thinking of there is in particular a flower farmer that I've seen whose entire stock has been demolished. Yeah, those we, we, the, we, we have concern for our, our nurseries, our flower farmers. We also should not forget about our loggers. Mm -hmm. 
as well. It's been a very, very, uh, and, you know, I'm working with Forest Parks and Recreation as well because our loggers, it's been so wet, they have not been able to get into the woods uh, to cut trees. But now they've not been able to get that those logs out of the out of the woods and get them to the mills to be processed as well. So that's a, that's a pocket that, as we discuss this overall recovery, um, we're always we're always partnering with our, our logging industry as well because they they're an important part of our landscape and our rural economy. Time for maybe one or two more. I just had a question about housing, uh, Governor. As you know, there's a pretty significant chunk of our housing that's been temporarily at least knocked offline and got people in shelters. What do you see as the the medium to long term vision of how this storm will affect what's already a really tight housing market? Yeah, uh, obviously we knew that there was a housing crisis. We've known that for a number of years. A um, number of people, leaders, uh, legislative leaders, have, have characterized that as as a crisis, uh, and this just further burdens that. And, and um, so we're, it's not lost on us. Uh, we're going to be doing all we can uh, during this situation uh, to, again, further uh, the, the replacement of, of housing and to, to build upon that. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that. And have you been in contact with lawmakers, the pro tem, the speaker, about whether it be housing or, or anything else that this questions that this storm might have arose that we might need to tackle in a legislative session or a special session? Yes. Yeah, I mean, Considering it's been four days, um, we are uh, just <laughs> taking care of the response right now. Uh, but those recovery, uh, our teams in uh, in ACCD uh, are already working on that, uh, and we'll be in conversations with uh, with the legislature to see if there's anything that we should do. Uh, but uh, but again, we know this was an issue um, before the legislative session. Uh, for the last five five years, it's been an issue. And, uh, and uh, this further impacts that. And so we will uh, continue uh, to, to do all we can uh, to work on that and uh, to alleviate that. Could you give us a quick update on what you expect now is going to happen on Sunday night and early Monday morning and how the state is preparing for that possibility? Yeah, uh, again, uh, we're asking Vermonters to be vigilant, be prepared. Um, we don't know the extent of some of these storms. There's one on, on Sunday, another one on Tuesday, uh, and then it appears that we're just going back into our pattern of almost every other day of, of rain. But um, and we haven't heard uh, about the intensity or, or the severity of these storms at this point in time. But, but to be honest, we had, didn't know three days ago about this one that we experienced last night. Um, so again, we will continue to to monitor. Um, we'll continue to listen to the experts, and we'll continue uh, to to communicate with all of you, uh, so that you can communicate with your listen listeners, um, so that we be prepared uh, if and when uh, there's another event. But again, uh, at this point, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the uh, the streams and rivers are receding. That's good news. Uh, the reservoirs. Uh, and dams, we're seeing uh, that level recede, so we have some storage capacity, and that's the important part. So, what we experienced again with this weather event was you know, three days of intense rain. Um, if we can get a few breaks here, we'll be able to have that storage capacity. We may have the flash flooding, but we'll have the storage capacity um, so that we can uh, so that it wouldn't impact our downtowns uh, quite as much as it did this time. So the past couple days, uh, there's kind of been a keen watch on dams. So now that river levels will hopefully kind of be going down, is there any type of um, assessment or inspection process going forward in the next couple yeah. of weeks with Brightsville, Queechy, dams across the state? All, all of them. We, we continue to monitor them, and we'll continue to, to see if there's any damage. We were concerned about the Queechy uh, situation. It appears we're OK there, for at least now. Um, but we continue to monitor each and every one of them. Could we get Dr. Levine back up? I thank you for being so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. I'm wondering if the department is at all bracing for an uptick in airborne illnesses, specifically COVID, with people in shelters in tight proximity. Yeah, fortunately, you know, respiratory infections are less common in the summer. Um, so most of the viruses are not uh, major players, and people are not congregated indoors most of the time. 
Um, COVID levels have not really been altered at the present time. It's obviously very early in the experience, but we're not seeing the kind of summertime surges we've seen in other summers during the pandemic, which is a great thing. But obviously, we continue to do surveillance on all of these conditions, COVID specifically. People should also understand the, you know, the healthcare system is up and running, and uh, it's had its challenges as a result of the floods. But the reality is uh, almost, uh, almost 100 percent of both inpatient and outpatient facilities are open. Our substance use disorder treatment system is open. Um, things are actually uh, available for any Vermonter in need. Has there been any increase in um, people coming into hospitals or doctor's offices for water intake illnesses? Like, I guess it would be food poisoning if they're thinking about water? Yeah, so I have not heard that as of yet. Obviously, this is still very early in the experience. Um, we will know if that occurs, but I've not heard that yet. What about uh, illnesses from coming into contact with blood water, like hepatitis or hepatitis? Yeah, those are the kinds of things I was cautioning people about in my comments. Again, I think that's a little early in the response yet, too, to understand if that's been an issue for people. But wearing all of the protective equipment we talked about and taking great care in those environments is really the key. Has there been any staffing issues at hospitals starting to see the doctor's offices? So staffing issues, uh, some of the hospitals were concerned about staffing issues, mostly because of transportation issues, not illness issues. I've not heard that any have gone to a critical level, uh, and they're all been they're all making do with the staff that they have at this time. And any delays in medication um, shipments to the state? Not that I've been informed. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Bob and Sarah, I guess.